Hey everybody, it's Monday and as our custom is around here, we go over content to help you pass NCLEX. So today's subject is myocardial infarction and I know we learned about this a lot, a lot, a lot in nursing school. Over a million people in the United States suffer from a myocardial infarction every single year. So you better believe it will be on a nursing license exam. And it's also in your quick facts book. So if you have this book and you're taking notes on it, the information for myocardial infarction is on page 56. Is that right? Let me just double check it right now because we will be referencing this book. Hi, everybody. Come on in. It's myocardial infarction day. And I'm not going to tarry long here. Yeah, 56. Okay. I'm not going to tarry long on myocardial infarction because tonight, y'all know what time it is. We have Remar Nurse University and we have to continue to fill out our workbook as we are going over a very new patient tonight. Do you have your workbooks? Are you ready for this? <laughs> okay. I am totally ready for our patient. Tonight, it will be Mr. Frank Jackson. And so part of Remar Nurse University is preparing you for next-gen NCLEX by looking at his information. And what we do is we take a patient, we get a report, and then we break down their care according to the nursing priorities. We like to call this Remar Nurse University. Get into it. Um, so it started last week. It started last week. But on tonight, we will be doing our second patient. So it's not too late for you to join. And as well, this is a free event. This is a free event. So literally, you're watching this on Facebook or you're watching this like right here on YouTube tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Set your alarm. All you have to bring is number one, yourself. Make a commitment to this. And then if you have your workbook, bring it. Bring it in a pen. All right. And then also, if you have my V2 program, which is my full NCLEX review, that workbook is in the file vault of V2. So check out your file vault. It is a resource for you. In the file vault, you're going to find the RNU workbook. You can also find my other book, Quick Facts for Pediatrics. It's an entire book I just put in there for people who have V2, okay? Um, and then if you still need to sign up for this event, go ahead and do it. Go to Remar Nurse. Um, forward slash R N U. Uh, I have to stop and pause for the cause because we got a testimonial here. Paul Marie Nurse James says, "Hey everyone, I took my NCLEX June second last week. NCLEX R N, and I found out I passed this morning. I'm official, a Remar nurse. Thank you so much for coming back. You knew where to find us, uh, and so I just want to thank you for coming in and you're motivating somebody today." on this Monday, you just took next gen. We want to be where you are. All right. We want to be where you are. So congratulations to you, nurse James. And come on in. We have another one. <sighs> Thank you, Remar team. I passed my NCLEX RN representing for RNs right now. Um, this past Thursday, God bless. I'm a Remar nurse. <laughs> Congratulations, nurse Vanessa Ferras. Am I saying that right? I know I'm not saying that, but I, I just want to congratulate you again. New RN, congratulations. We take time to congratulate our Remar nurses because that positivity is what's going to push us through. You graduate, you congratulating nurse Vanessa. Okay. Two Remar nurses in like the first two minutes. But anyways, you, you congratulating her, you might think about her when you're taking your NCLEX. Like, she, she can do it. I'm next. Or when I saw her testimonial, I said, I'm next. Okay. Um, and so these, these nurses are showing up disruptors of the, the broadcast. And I love it. Get the V2, get the V2 guys. I'm telling you, this is how it is. <laughs> all right. We always, we always take time for anybody that shows up. Hey, Took my NCLEX May 31st, not too long ago, and I passed RN. RN's for the win today in V2, um, and I like it. Keisha, come on in, because right now we're just congratulating people. I'm used to seeing you on here, but right now we're just congratulating people, and then Felicia is letting everybody know she's next, okay? Um, and then that's that's what 
this whole thing is about you claiming your you claiming your spot okay whether it's rn or pm but the rns are representing today remar nurses y'all are so beautiful i love it thank you so much for coming in is there anybody else that would like to say they passed is there anybody else that would like to say i'm next okay all right we are going to be starting the topic myocardial infarction if you have this book out and I don't say something from this book that you think is important for people to know, put it in the comments for me, okay? And then I'll try to read the comments. Here are the slides. Okay, I like it, I like it. Nurse Edward says, I'm next, baby. I got it. <laughs> like it, I love it. I appreciate y'all. I appreciate y'all coming on here, letting you know, because this is who you'll be more than likely testing with. Got your book out now, let's roll. All right, guys, we are going to get into our topic Thank you for the introductions. Thank you for jumping on here. It's the start of the summer. It's the start of the summer. I just dropped my kids off for summer camp. So I'm literally um, in a house that's pretty quiet. And I'm wondering if there's any parents in the same situation. Kids are off at summer camp. I'm super nervous because I homeschool my kids. So they never really leave. And now they're at camp. And I'm just like, okay, y'all got to help me take my mind off of my kids being at summer camp. So let's get into it. Here we go. All right. Myocardial infarction. What we have is um, an irreversible necrosis of the heart muscle. So we are focusing on the myocardium and, and it, it has to do with why does the infarction happen? It happens because of ischemia. It happens because of ischemia. So when you talk about ischemia in a person, we talk about ischemia in a person. Ischemia always feels like what? What does ischemia feel like? Because whenever you see that that term, or if we're talking about myocardial infarction, that's going to be the thing that you are going to be most concerned about as a nurse. Will my patient have ischemia at the end of this? Because if they do, we're going to have to treat some 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 other issues later on. So tell me, how does ischemia feel? Not what it is. I see people putting what it is. Yeah, so you can have necrosis, but like, how is that going to feel to our patients? Low oxygen in the tissues. Yeah, but tell me, how does it feel? I see the comments, low oxygen in the tissue, no blood supply. That's definitely a, um, that's definitely a problem with the, with the patient. Okay. Mm. Not quite. You guys are definitely thinking about the patient situation. You're thinking about it from a nursing perspective, clinically perspective. Think about it from a patient perspective. I'm asking you, how does it feel? Not what it is. Okay. Definitely. There we go. Okay. It's painful. This is extremely painful to your patient. So when they present... Yes, when they present to the emergency room or wherever you find them, they're not going to care about nothing else but the pain, okay? They're, so if a person is having sharp pest, chest pain, like, and I remember a guy being, he was big like Mark, a big guy, right? And he actually looked like Mark a little bit, but just a little bit older. He came into the room and he literally was just, banging on his chest the entire time. That's that's all he could do. The pain was so bad. So you think about putting a medical ID on this patient, trying to get a medical history, trying to get, have you taken any medications or drugs or anything like that? Wasn't happening. The man was in so much pain that he literally just beat on his chest because he was in, he couldn't get past the pain. So this is what you would expect to see in men who have myocardial infarctions going on, all right? This is not a patient that's going to be sitting there. Yes, nurse. No, nurse. Yes, I'm ready for the IV. Yes, put the IV in here. Cut all of that, all right? You're going to have to make this patient comfortable, put on the oxygen. You know, you may not get to do any teaching. How about that for NCLEX? No teaching may be done in this situation. So as we're preparing for next-gen NCLEX, we really have to get out of 
um, the perfect kind of world that we exist in in nursing school and the nursing school exams and look for something a little more real. Look for the clinical priorities. If you have a patient with a myocardial infarction that is not going to be sitting there waiting for you to teach them the benefits of aspirin in a moment like this, okay? So when we talk about pain, um, we're talking about myocardial infarction at the highest level, especially for men. Now I could get into perhaps how women present with myocardial infarction. <laughs> it might look a little bit different, just a tad bit, because women have a higher tolerance for pain. So if you have a woman coming in with myocardial infarction, she may be sitting there like, I got some numbness in the shoulder area. Like, I just need y'all to, I just came in because my daughter told me to come in here, but I am going to go back to work once I get finished with here. But that's a different story. So the, the issue that I'm, I'm meaning to address though, in this point in time is that there are several reasons and several presentations for myocardial infarction. Now, this is just for those of you who may be in nursing school that like to have a little bit more detail, but there are certain types of myocardial infarctions. And the different type is based off of the etiology or where that myocardial infarction comes from. If that makes sense, like what is causing it? Now, again, this is for those of you who actually, you know, want to just know a little bit more detail about it. Maybe you're in nursing school and you've gone over this. So type one is a primary coronary event. So it's literally an issue a first issue with the heart that is causing the infarction. The heart attack is directly related to an issue with the heart. It's primary to that, okay? Type two is impaired oxygen supply and demand. And so at some point, sometimes if the patient is overexerted for an activity, then uh, you may have an issue with myocardial infarction. Now, Myocardial infarction is so common that they have been able to actually time the day when most people have a myocardial infarction. Do you guys know what this is? What time of day are myocardial infarctions most expected? Is it morning or is it night? Let's start there. Comments on the screen. When are myocardial infarctions most likely to occur? Very predictable, very predictable time of day. Tell me when, and I'll tell you why. This is the exchange. This is the exchange. I love the comments on the screen. You guys are amazing. You're showing up and you are like giving it a try, okay? And my goal is just to challenge you to evaluate where you are, okay? Where you are in your studying process. Many of you have already been to nursing school. You've been lectured on this ad nauseum and I'm going over the major points. Myocardial infarctions are most likely to occur in the early morning, okay, between about 4 a.m. to 10 a.m. That is when they occur. If you think about it, why is that? When we talked about the different types of myocardial infarctions, type two was the impaired oxygen supply and demand. And so when you are resting, are you expecting to have an increase in oxygen supply and demand when you're sleeping? When you're at night and you are just, um, you know, watching TV and kind of chilling with your spouse and talking about the day, no increase in oxygen demand there. Nope. But early in the morning, about 4 a.m., 5 a.m., some people are really early risers, 6 a.m., you get up. You get up, you got to start your day. You got to go, maybe you got to go to your journal, pray. Then you got to go take a shower. Then you got to go cook breakfast, eat breakfast, wake up the kids, get to work, uh, deal with your coworkers. And so you are moving early in the morning. You are busy, especially in, in our society. And so for type two impaired oxygen supply, I want you guys to think about early morning being the most Mm, the most likely time for this to occur. And we're talking about early morning. So hopefully that makes sense because a lot of you have picked night. You won't forget that now. You won't forget that now. You're busier in the morning. And so your heart has to work harder, okay? And this can be um, very precipitative of a myocardial infarction, especially if you have plaque in the arteries, right? If you have plaque in your arteries and then you have to have a big burst of adrenaline, adrenaline will do it. And so that's another thing that is correlated to 
myocardial infarctions, I just remembered, is you have an increased rush in adrenaline because you got to get up and you got to go. Okay. Like me this morning when I dropped my kids off to camp. So, uh, okay. Type three is a sudden cardiac death um, before blood samples can be obtained. So it's kind of like, we're not really sure what is going on with the patient, but they did have a, a, a a myocardial infarction, they died, and we're not sure why, okay? Four is the percutaneous coronary intervention. So for patients who need to have this procedure done, and this is an exploratory procedure, right? Um, and so for patients who need to have this done, a risk is myocardial infarction afterwards, actually. And so there is a direct type of heart attack that occurs as a result of a percutaneous coronary intervention. So uh, registered nurses, you guys might want to know that, especially if you're going to do any type of cardiac nursing, because when your patient comes in for this procedure, you're going to have to um, be on the, on the lookout for them to have a myocardial infarction afterwards. Five is a thrombosis. It's actually a, a stent thrombosis. And of course, this makes sense where any type of blood clot, any type of thrombosis is going to put your patient at risk for a decrease or an interruption of the blood flow, which is just, um, you know, what we're talking about in myocardial infarctions. And then type five is coronary artery bypass grafting. Have you guys ever heard of a cabbage before in nursing school? Or if you are on the unit and the patient has to have a cabbage or had a cabbage five years ago, this is what they're talking about. Um, coronary artery bypass grafting. And so essentially open heart surgery. And your patient, anytime, anytime, of course, you are going to be exploring the heart, it's possible that some interruption or blood flow uh, decrease can happen. And so during a cabbage, it's a very severe procedure, right? Very, very severe. Um, your patient can have a myocardial infarction after a cabbage procedure. So take a look again at this, um, this list and, and you are going to just, just, re, just be able to determine that there are several types of, several types of reasons for heart attacks, okay? Because we use it pretty general in a general sense. Our risk factors, you have control, uncontrollable and controllable risk factors for pretty much everything. The uncontrollable ones, nursing students, are going to be the ones that a person cannot change about themselves, okay? So your age, your race, your gender, those are things you cannot change. Now, I'm not getting into the changing of gender. I'm not going to do that today. We, we're going to just, you know, address the general principles of uncontrollable risk factors. Controllable risk factors are going to be things that a person can alter about their lifestyle. So tobacco and drug and alcohol use. Hypertension, okay, hypertension, because there are things that you can do to lower your blood pressure. There's medications you can take. There's a diet change. Um, there's exercise and weight loss goals, things like that, okay? Hyperlipidemia, cholesterol. Having cholesterol, a high cholesterol is not something that you have to be stuck with forever, okay? Physical inactivity, obesity, diet, nutrition, and stress. And so what we're talking about are the controllable or treatable risk factors with myocardial infarction, okay? And this information, honestly, whether you're taking NCLEX RN or NCLEX PN, you need to understand the principles of ischemia, uh, the signs and symptoms of myocardial infarction. There's really not much that the practical nurse should not know, okay, that the RN has to know for NCLEX. Practical nurses should be preparing like registered nurses, to be honest. You're going to feel so much more confident. Um, and you're going to approach your exam much differently, okay? All right, so if I'm doing something on YouTube or Facebook is for both practical nurses and registered nurses. I expect for practical nurses to know what an uncontrollable uh, risk factor is for myocardial infarction. I expect you guys to know pretty much 
every every slide on here you should be familiar with. Okay, so what happens during an MI? What happens during an MI? Now, if I go to the Quick Facts book, I'm going to just read to you guys um, the considerations that I put here in Quick Facts, and then I'll go into that slide. So the cause of an MI is going to be a decrease in oxygen supply to the heart. Now, the pain is typ typically felt, we'll, we'll go over that in a second, where the pain is felt by. But for this, what we are going to focus on is that at the end of what your patient experiences, the problem is they have a decrease in their blood flow to the heart. So that ischemia is going to be the result of everything else that I'm about to read. Okay, so let me get into this slide now. All right. So what happens during an MI? The risk factors causes endothelial damage. So whether those risk factors are controllable or uncontrollable, they're going to cause endothelial damage. Now, the dysfunction of the endothelium activates the inflammatory process. So a lot of the problem with myocardial infarction and necrosis of the tissue starts off as inflammation, okay? Simply inflammation of the tissues. And that that is a, a lot of a, problems with a lot of people, right? Anytime you talk about um, chronic pain, whether it's chronic or acute, you have something like, you know, rheumatoid arthritis. It's an inflammatory process, something like that, okay? So inflammatory processes now, in the heart, in the endothelial tissue, they develop arthrosclerotic plaques. These plaques are going to rupture, okay? They're going to accumulate, and then they're going to cause a disruption of the blood flow. Okay. Irreversible damage to the myocardium can begin as early as 20 to 40 minutes after the interruption of blood flow. Necrosis occurs first in the subendocardial layer and spreads like a wave front throughout the thickness of the wall of the heart. Okay. All right. So these are the things that happen during an MI. You're going to start with inflammation and then continuing with the decrease in blood supply and blood flow, it is going to lead to cellular necrosis. And that cellular necrosis starts from the inside and then waves outward throughout the thickness of the heart, okay? So clinical manifestations, this is page 56. I see people asking, this is page 56 on Quick Facts. What is it gonna feel like to your patient? Chest pain. We talked about that ischemia and it's going to be bad chest pain. It's going to radiate down to the shoulders. Right side or left side? Because I didn't put it on here. Okay. Right side or left side? Tell me what side are we expecting this? Yes. What I'm reading though, what I just read right there was just, it was a lot of detail to explain the, um, etiology, the pathophysiology of what's happening on a cellular level. That is not in Quick Facts because NCLEX is not going to ask you about that. But some people, as they're learning about a topic, they need that further explanation. There's somebody in here that maybe didn't learn this in nursing school yet, or you don't remember it. So I'm, I'm going over it a little bit of detail, but I'm using Quick Facts for those of you who are here for the review. Somebody asked me, what is necrosis? See, that's a perfect example of the mixed audience that we have here. Probably the majority of you know that uh, what necrosis is, but there's maybe somebody here that doesn't know what necrosis is. Can somebody put that in the comments? What is necrosis? Because that is that's definitely a fundamental thing. Or you like like yes, look it up because that's definitely a term that every nurse should know. What is MI? Okay, MI, and see how it is when we become nurses and we become you know really flu fluent. We start using language that. Maybe people don't know. MI stands for myocardial infarction. So it's a shortened version. Instead of saying myocardial infarction, we just say MI. Okay. All right. Necrosis 
good. Thank you guys. Necrosis is um, tissue death. When something is necrotic, it means it has died. Okay. So there's no blood flow. There's no cellular activity. Um, tissues can become necrotic. So whether we're talking about, you know, gangrene, a diabetic's foot becomes necrotic, has necrosis. We got to cut the foot off because it's not, it's, there's necrosis there. Your heart can get like that too. All right. So when we talk about where the pain is felt, the clinical manifestations, we're talking about chest pain. We are saying we're expecting this to be left-sided chest pain. The heart's on the left side. Okay. So when it radiates, okay, so the pain can radiate down the left shoulder. And so women, they have, they have left shoulder pain. Okay. Like, um, also we have diaphoresis, sweating. Okay. The pain is going to last a long time, last longer, long, long, long. Um, and this is very important for you to know on page 57 is very important for you to know the differential diagnosis with myocardial infarction. When I talk about differential diagnosis, that's very important for next gen NCLEX because they can present to you two or three conditions that mirror each other. They have similar symptoms, but there is slight differences that let you know one is more probable than the other. So what is myocardial infarction often mistaken for? And the time factor of me saying this pain lasts longer than 30 minutes lets you know, okay? Because there's another chest pain. There's another chest pain that you can have. There's another chest pain that you can have that's not a myocardial infarction. Does anybody know what it is? Ooh, yes, yes angina. Okay. What's the difference between a myocardial infarction and angina? This is, this is, this is straight up content right here. This is how you prepare for content. I'm not even asking y'all questions. We are literally reviewing the scope of this topic. Okay. When, and I said, yes, good job. Heartburn is another one too, that myocardial infarction can kind of be, um, Mm, kind of be mistaken for, well, oh, that's some, some bad heartburn though. Oh, very good. Very good, T-Rob. It's good to see you here today. Um, angina is relieved with rest, okay? Whereas you can sit there and you can tell the patient, sit down, have a seat, have a seat. That chest pain is not going to go away. There's another thing that also relieves angina that won't relieve a myocardial infarction. Mm. Oh, let's get into it. Let's get into it. I'll tell Mark, Mark, this one's going to run a little bit longer because y'all have me on it. We, we're on a tangent now. Yes. Good job. So our, um, when we're talking about, I'm trying to show that comment. When we are talking about um, myocardial infarction or angina, we know that angina is going to be relieved by rest and nitroglycerin. Okay. So that's not going to work for myocardial infarction. Why is the nitroglycerin not going to work for myocardial infarction? Does anybody know that? I'm pressing y'all. Don't just put stuff up on the comments and then not know why. Why? Mm. Here in Quick Facts, it says angina is chest pain that has a typical onset location lasts for three to five minutes and is relieved by nitroglycerin or rest. Okay. So that's true. But why would not nitroglycerin work for the patient with myocardial infarction? Y'all have it. I'm so proud of y'all today. I'm so proud of y'all today. Exactly. Because what is um, nitroglycerin is a vasodilator. So if you just have angina with normal chest pain, it's going to open up those vessels and you're going to feel better. Like, oh, the pain has gone away now. But when those tissues and that area is dead, you can pump, you can pump nitroglycerin into a necrotic <laughs> tissue all you want. Is it going to respond and open up? No, it's just going to be painful. It's just going to be painful. That's good. That's good. I love it. Great comments, guys. And this is my favorite comment. I'm not sure. All right. And that's the position you should take. 
um, and you're here to learn. And that's why I'm glad everybody's here because we're all learning together. Okay. Good job. Tissues can't help it. They can't respond. They're dead. All right. Excellent job, guys. Uh, what else do we have to go over for here? So we are expecting, we are expecting chest pain. We're expecting left-sided, um, you know, dominance here. We are also expecting sweating, diaphoresis, weakness, irritability. All right. And this pain is lasting a longer time when compared to angina or heartburn. Okay. Now, anything else? Tissues there? Okay, good, 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 good. So how are we going to be interested in investigating a myocardial infarction? Well, there are, there are several things that you need to know, okay? There are several things that you need to know in terms of diagnostics. And of course, a clinical except physical assessment, we always start, we always start with physical assessment of our patient, just with our eyes, what we can see. Uh, we can do vital signs as well. But for myocardial infarction, your priority is not so much the, the physical assessment, but the diagnostics. Yes, we need to have that ECG, EKG done. Because if my patient is having a true myocardial infarction, I'm going to see it in the electrical activity of the heart. And that's the beauty of an EKG. Okay, that's the beauty of an EKG. You're going to see it. And what would I be looking for? Cheryl says, what if there is no pain? A silent MI. Um, I, th I think there's a use, there may be a certain use case for that, but it's very rare. It's very rare. Even if a person doesn't have all of the symptoms of a myocardial infarction, Cheryl, I think there would still be some discomfort. Anytime you have chest pain, or anytime you have cellular death, it's painful. It's painful. So I would question if a person was having a silent myocardial infarction. Not, not to say that they can't, but for NCLEX, I think that would be a very rare case that they wouldn't put on there. Um, so I asked the question, what are we going to see? <laughs> what are we going to see on the EKG, ECG? Yes. So we want to get that ECG, EKG done within 10 minutes of arrival. Like that should be the first thing coming in. I'm not going to need an order for that. Like they usually have what is called um, a coronary protocol, MI protocols, where somebody comes in complaining of chest pain, your immediate response is oxygen, EKG, lab workup, right? Most hospitals as a facility will imp implement that. So what we're looking for, though, is what Frederick has here, STEMI and non-STEMI. STEMI and non-STEMI. And the STEMI part that we are looking for, um, that's going to be ST elevation. And you will see ST elevation. ST is a segment on your um, EKG, all right? P, QRS, ST. If you don't know that, you need to get in my V2. You need to get in my V2. But um, ST elevation is what is expected. Most of you guys know that. ST elevation is what is expected on um, a myocard, a true myocardial infarction. Okay, good job. Biochemical. So when the heart is damaged, it will signal through the blood, I'm damaged. I'm not okay. Okay, and the way it does that is laboratory values. So when we're talking about a myocardial infarction, you always do an EKG because EKG is showing you electrical activity. Okay, EKG is not going to ever show you troponin, CKMB, right? It's not going to show you anything like that. You have to go back to clinicals now, like right, right now. Okay, um, or are you in school? Stay here. I'm trying to replace clinicals for y'all, okay? This is the debriefing you guys should do after clinicals. So the, uh, what I'm saying is that the EKG is going to be much different from a blood draw, okay? Now, when you are looking for your biochemical markers, that's your troponin. That is your CKMB. That's your creatinine kinase. These are things that are going to be released if muscles are damaged or particularly the heart muscles. Troponin is going to be your most important one for your heart. Okay. All right. Yeah. 
All right, link to get this book. You can get it on remarnurse.com or it's also on Amazon. Either way, make sure you get the next gen edition. Okay, all right. Imaging echocardiogram, a PET CT or MRI is also going to show you the anatomy of the heart. You're going to have imaging of the heart. You're going to be able to see the dead parts of the heart. However, why? Mm, let, me, let, me, let me make myself presenter. The patient comes in with chest pain. Why is the priority going to be laboratory draws over an MRI? An MRI is going to show you the heart. Okay. It's going to show you the heart so you can see what's going on. The blood work is not going to show you the heart, but why is the blood work more important than an MRI in the instance of, of chest pain? Mm, it's gonna show you how much damage. Okay, what else? Levels, mm. labs give you the time it happened. That is true. That is true. You can you can know based on the increase in levels how long that damage has been. To check for clotting, mm, true. Lab work, okay. These are good comments. Initially, though, what I'm thinking is that if a patient comes in, if a patient comes in with chest pain, do I want to send them to an MRI to actually see the heart or do I want to grab labs on them? Well, for instances of NCLEX, you want to know and you want to think safety and priority. Which one is going to be faster? Which one is going to give you the most information faster? Definitely the what? The labs. Absolutely the labs. Because yes, the MRI is going to show me, the MRI is going to show me the heart, show me where the areas of damage is, but how long does it take to do an MRI? You're going to be waiting a long time. How long does it take for an MRI? Have you ever had one before? Are you ever waited for a patient to have one to get back for one? <laughs> All this time. You don't have time for that. So is it two hours? It takes a long time. So even though NCLEX will present you the option and you may think of it. I know some, I know a lot of people will because I've, I've seen it done. People will say MRIs, CTs. CTs are a little bit quicker, but still there's some prep that has to you know take place. These diagnostic exams take a long time. When you think about an MRI, MRIs are never like the first thing that happens. If you work in an emergency room and a patient comes in with chest pain or um, abdominal pain or any kind of leg issues, leg cramping, and they say send them for an MRI, like that's the first thing that you do, that's not a good hospital. That patient, that hospital is out for money or something because the MRIs take a long time, okay? So these are things that you have to know, you know, as nurses, you, you got to know. You got to know how long these things take, okay? All right, let's get back into it. Y'all getting me off track here. All right, I got to stick to the slides. So it, echocardiogram, PET, CT, MRI. Those are diagnostic images that happens mm, last, okay? All right. So the management really depends on whether the patient is unstable or stable, okay? So I don't really want y'all to spend too much time on this because what, what you need to know about next-gen NCLEX is that the priorities that the doctors are prescribing the treatment because we got caught up in nurses memorizing medications and not really understanding how they're working with the total patient presentation. Okay, so we're moving away from memorizing what a beta blocker is, naming what a beta blocker is, and really understanding what is the overall goal of treatment. 
Okay, so that's what I want you to focus on as I show this slide, please. So acute management versus non-acute management. Acute management means the patient is unstable. We need to restore blood flow now. Okay, we need to get that blood flow going now. So there are some things that can have that can do that reperfusion therapy, reperfusion meaning reperfusion. Okay, it means getting that blood flow restored. So you could do um, a per percutaneous coronary intervention. You could do fibro uh, fibrinolysis. All right, if there is a blood clot, we need to break it down. You can also do your usual suspects, aspirin, nitrates, beta blockers, anticoagulants, antiplatelets. This is how you are going to manage reperfusion, okay? Non-acute management is going to have for a stable client. You're just controlling the disease progression. You don't want it to get too far, um, you know, gone. This is like that tertiary interventions. And there's a list of things that you could do for the tertiary prevention of making it not worse or not progressing. Okay. I'm not even going to stay here. All right. Too long. Okay. Therapy for specific symptoms, meaning... We are, these are, this is what, you know, this is the, <laughs> this is the usual that we learn in nursing school. We're giving for myocardial infarctions, which is an MI, going to give your nitrates. Nitroglycerin is going to be, nitroglycerin is going to be the most popular one that you need to know. There, nitroglycerin is so popular that there's two sections of nitroglycerin in quick facts. All right. Um, nitroglycerin is in the front for question and answers. And then nitroglycerin also has its own section in the pharmacology section of this book. Nitroglycerins, opioids, morphine, opioids, morphine, diuretics, your usual diuretics. Ferrosamide is going to be probably the popular one. Oxygen, oxygen is a medication. Aspirin is also a medication for the patient to not have blood clots in the future. And then good old fashioned, good old fashioned chest compressions, life support, CPR, okay? Um, so you could do advanced cardiac life support or you could do CPR, okay? The correct order is what? Go ahead and put that, that it's definitely not Mona, okay? Definitely not Mona. So put the order if you know it. Okay, let me see it. Oh, Nam. Good job. Good job. Okay, hold on one second. Um, mm, I'm getting a phone call and I'm wondering if, if it's the camp calling me about my kids. Hold on, y'all. I got to take this call. Hello? Mom stuff. Yes, this is she. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. Yeah, no, I didn't feel, no, I didn't forget about it. I'm just not going on vacation right now. But anyhow, I got to call you back, okay? So um, let me call you back about that vacation because I'm not going. All right, bye-bye. So um, anyways, you know how you guys sign up for like, you'll sign up for like travel um, coupons and things like that. And then they call you like, you didn't book the vacation that you said you wanted to book. And it's like so much pressure. Like I, I'm going to book it when I'm ready. All right. Anyways. So let's go back to this. I'm glad it wasn't the camp. All right. So, oh, Nam. So oxygen, nitroglycerin, aspirin, and morphine. This is what you put for NCLEX. All right. Now in real life, you're going to do something totally different, but for NCLEX, you got to stick to this. All right. Nursing priorities. So in all of this is happening with your patient. Remember, I told you guys, you're going to have a patient that comes in and their, their main concern to you is going to be chest pain, okay? Their main priority to you is going to be chest pain. But we know clinically, our main priority, the biggest thing that is going to linger with this patient, if we don't interrupt it, is going to be necrosis, ne 
necrosis, necrosis. That's going to be our main thing. So we got to do an assessment about that chest pain, that pain and ischemia. So um, let me let me make this so you guys can see it. So when we're talking about chest pain, we are thinking of N-O-P-Q-R-S-T. N-O-P-Q-R-S-T. All right. And that's chest pain assessment for my cardiac nurses out there. So N is normal. Is the is this a normal pain for the patient? O, onset. When did it happen? P, is there any precipitating factors or palliative factors? Like, you know, does it get better when you rest or does it not matter? Because that's going to tell the difference between uh, angina or what we talked about, which is uh, myocardial infarction. Also, the P can also stand for palliative. The P can also stand for palliative because if it gets better with nitroglycerin or rest, then we know that it's positive for angina. But if it doesn't, then that is going to be our um, our indication that we're leaning towards myocardial infarction. Okay. Let me say onam dead cells. Yes. Q stands for quality. What is the quality of pain? R, I was taught Mona in school. I know going back to that, that Mona is just a way that you memorize it. It's a way that teachers help you learn the information, but that is not going to be the best for actually administering it based off of research. Okay. All right. All right. So where was that? R is the, the region of the pain. S is the severity of the pain. So we're asking from a scale from, you know, zero to 10, what is going to be the, um, what is going to be the pain rating. And for children, you're going to use like faces, but for adults, we're going to use zero to 10. And we're talking about myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction usually does not happen in the pediatric population. So this is going to definitely be an adult, um, definitely going to be an adult issue. And then T, T is going to stand for the, the time of the pain. Is it elongated? Is it five minutes? Is it 20 minutes? Is it 30 minutes? Okay. N stands for normal. Is this a normal pain? It's kind of like, you know, a gimme question. Like, is it normal? Of course, it's probably not going to be normal. Okay. All right. Also, we are facilitating and we are administering the prescribed medications. And whatever the doctor prescribes, we have to make sure that as nurses, we have an understanding of how that medication is going to treat the problem and also the expected and unexpected side effects of that medication. Nurses are literally the last defense for our patients. And how the climate of nursing has changed, guys, is this, where if you give a medication and you give it inappropriately, or if you give a medication and it does harm to your patient, okay, nurses now can be prosecuted for that. You will be definitely, I, I would say that watching the nurse that was convicted of, um, you know, murder, because she gave a, an appropriate medication and a patient died was very sobering because it, there used to be a time where if nurses gave a medication that they were able to be protected, you know, and they were able to be like, well, I was just doing what the doctor said. I was filling the prescription. Now it's you gave that medication. So you were definitely involved in the harm that was caused by this patient. And you now are going to be responsible for that harm. Okay. So take it serious guys, when it comes to pharmacology, I can't say this enough to you. Never give a medication that you don't know. Never. I don't care how busy you get. I don't care how cool the doctor is. I don't care how long he been doing it. Make sure you understand what a medication is for because number one, if a patient asks you, Hey, what's this for? And you don't know, it's very embarrassing. Number one, and you're going to lose that patient's trust. Okay. And usually, most of the time, from my experience, if a patient is asking you what a medication is for, they already know. They just want to make sure if you know that happens so much. Okay. 
And if you don't know that medication or you give them some bogus answer, that's it. Okay. So number one, you need to know that because it's really embarrassing as a nurse if you don't know why you're given the medication. Two, also, you now are going to be responsible if that medication causes harm to a patient. Yes, you're part of it. So make sure that you are studying these medications appropriately. Okay, that's off my safety horse. Uh, that's off my, you know, my safety hobby horse. Got to know about facilitating medications. Health teaching. Got to know about um, what it is to be stable in this condition and also how to prepare uh, a patient for discharge. Another thing is monitoring for complications. Cardiogenic shock. Okay. Cardiac dysrhythmias that can be associated or can come, okay, can come after you give a medication or after a patient has had a myocardial infarction. Very real. This is very, very real to, um, to the population and the culture of nursing, okay? You need to be responsible for what you do. I like this comment. I just want to say here, fired, arrested, lose your hard work. I just saw this happen at work. A nurse gave insulin and did not check the AM blood sugar. Okay. Yep. Before you give a medication, introduce yourself to the medication. Okay. I like that. And as you guys are preparing, I just, this is a huge point for me. Question banks are not going to do that for you. You need to get into the content. All right, because then you're able to see the big picture. But if you're doing 50, 60 questions a day randomly, and that's how you're preparing for NCLEX, that's scary. That's scary because there's a lot of content that you won't see in that question bank. If you're just doing random questions, you need to look at the big picture. Show up here. This is how we do it. OK. All right. Um, so what happened is now, guys, is that I don't have time to do the rest of this program. I don't, we spend so much time doing, <laughs> we spend so much time doing the content that the questions are secondary. So I just got to do like, let me do like a few questions here. All right, um, let me just do, Mark told me to do like one question. Let me see. Okay, here's the first question. We got to go to questions right now because we have RNU tonight. This is my plug for RNU. We're finishing our workbook, 8 p.m., 8 p.m. Eastern standard time. All right, here's our first question. Fast fingers. A client was brought to the ED with intermittent chest pain for the past two hours. The nurse knows that irreversible cardiac damage happens if there has been insufficient blood flow in the heart for blank amount of minutes. Okay. What would you say? Number one, five, Two, 10, 3, 15, or 4, 30. Come on through. Which one? Okay. Um, a lot of people are saying number four. I love it. I love it. Correct, an not 15. Okay, yeah, let me just show the correct answer. Correct answer is number four, 30 minutes. Yeah. If the blood and oxygen supply is cut off, muscle cells of the heart begin to suffer and die. Um, and that starts, um, begins to suffer and die. So irreversible damage, that should say 30. I'm sorry, guys. Irreversible damage um, begins after 20 minutes of blockage, but that should say 30. I apologize for that. As a result, heart muscles are affected by the lock of oxygen. So let me just be clear. That should definitely say 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. I, I, what's going to happen is these questions came from the question bank in V2. So if you have V2 and you do cardiac, you will definitely find myocardial infarction questions there. So I'm going to refer you all to the question bank in V2, but I have to go now so that I can prepare for R&U. Set your alarms and join me tonight because actually for tonight's topic, our patient is going to have issues of acute renal failure appendicitis or pancreatitis. So those are the three that we will be differential diagnosing tonight. If you don't have this workbook, you need to get it. 
Okay. Go to remarnurse.com forward slash R N U R N U because all of the month of June, we're doing a free NCLEX review all of the month of June. So this will be fun tonight. It's going to be a lot different because we don't have, um, we don't have an like labs that we're actually going to be looking at tonight. We're going to be, this is the page that we'll be going over. So we're literally going to be just doing differential diagnosis of this patient and appendicitis, pancreatitis, these are huge and you want to know the difference between those two. Okay. Um, v oh, V2, V2. That's right. The V2 sale V2 right now is $89. Okay. It's still $89. That price will be going up at the end of RNU, which is the end of June. And, um, so it'll be going up to 169, right? 169. So, this is the last month that we're doing the, actually it's the Black Friday price. We never changed it for Black Friday. Then when Christmas time came around, we didn't change it for Christmas. Valentine's Day came up. We still kept it at $89 because we had some like, oh man. Anyways, so now it is changing and it's going back up 169, 169, 169. All right. So get V2 before the end of this month, y'all. All right. Um, somebody says this and game night on Wednesday. We're doing another game night. Okay. On Wednesday, we'll be doing game night is Wednesday at nine o'clock. We'll be doing pages 11 through 20 of quick facts. Okay. <laughs> All right. What else? That's it. That's our week. That is our week in review. Thank you so much. Monday's at eight and then, um, Wednesday's at nine and game night. All right. And so V2 is for next gen NCLEX. Also, Quick Facts is for nursing school. I'm trying to think of it. Quick Facts is for nursing school too. If you want to get started, most of you guys already have this book. So you literally have half of my program already. If you have this book, you have half of my program. You literally just need to add the lectures. If you have this book already, the price for V2 drops from 89 to 69. Okay. So you already have this book. All right. So I will see you guys tonight, 8 p.m. Got to go, guys. Thank you so much for watching on today. I will see you later. Email me support at remarreview.com if you need something specific about your account. Um, support at remarreview.com. That is my email, okay? So email me if it's anything specific. And it doesn't matter what it is. Just send me, just send me the email and we'll figure it out together, okay? All right. I'll see you later. Bye.